Welcome back to Insights. I'm joined by ACC Professor of Political Science, Tim Kuhnlein. And Tim, we were just talking about the inauguration of now President Trump. Um, and I want to move to some of the themes of his campaign and his speech. And one of them he talks about is America first. So let's dive into what that means. Well, I think what he is trying to do is um, use an expression that talks about bringing back our resources that have been spread throughout the world for various objectives, um, American imperialism. Uh, we've been on an expansionist agenda for the better part of a century now, over a century, going back to Theodore Roosevelt. Um, but I think that um, even like Obama, Obama recognized we need to kind of pull back a bit, we're overextended, and to refocus our attention domestically. And he's um, suggesting that we're going to put um, domestic concerns first, focus on America first, not all these other countries. Um, and I think he's also alluding to a certain America, and that is the, 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 his notion of the hardworking American um, building infrastructure and investing in um, the industries that provide or have historically provided um, jobs for um, many, many Americans. It's a noble agenda. Um, Democrats have been tr arguing this all along. This was Bernie Sanders' message as well. Trump has managed to capitalize on these themes um, and to speak to an audience sufficiently enough to garner the votes that he needed to win the Electoral College. Um, by no means um, a landslide. Um, we're talking about 77,000 votes difference that crossed the Electoral College, one of the smallest Electoral College victories of the history of presidential elections, and certainly the loss by almost 3 million votes um, in the popular vote. But nonetheless, he's speaking very, I think, very clearly to a certain uh, audience. The problem is there's a lot of duality, and that's where people who know their history and know the duality of politics and the masterful nature in which he is a sort of public persona is able to, whether he's doing it intentionally or not, um, to sort of manipulate situations um, raises the ire of many. You know, this slogan, America First, goes back to um, the early 20th century, and it was used by people who were partial to Nazi Germany, industrialists. Um, and it, it conjures a lot of imagery. So there's really nothing new about what he's saying, although he's using old phrases, whether he knows it or not, that speak to certain audiences in a sort of a populist um, sentiment on a particular side of the political spectrum. And, you know, for example, his um, Make America Great Again, that was a slogan used in the Reagan um, campaigns. We just forget about it. So it's not new, but he's recreating a new image. And it's, it's you know, working in a sense, although the dualities are causing a lot of concern and reaction. What do you specifically mean by this? And let's talk about that one that was, you know, captivated the campaign, Make America Great Again. You see it on the hats and, you know, it's controversial to some because some people say, well, America's already great. How, you don't need to make it great again. Right. I remember Michelle Obama making a comment that she, early on in the Obama administration that she was happy to be proud of America. Um, and for the first time in her life, and um, uh, people are all over her suggesting, well, why wouldn't you be proud of America? You know, we play on these semantics, it's politics, and unfortunately it distracts a lot of our attention and we don't deal with the real problems. But I, you know, what I heard in Trump, giving him the benefit, um, is that I, I almost heard an appeal for a shared prosperity, meaning we can't ignore people who are on the losing end of this financial equation of global economic development and the role that America has played in that, in terms, particularly in terms of its policies. Um, and of course, the free trade agreements and all that, that go fly in the face of the Republican Party agenda, because that really all comes from that side of the spectrum, um, free market uh, libertarian um, policies on the international scale. Um, so I heard this, uh, sort of reach for shared prosperity, um, it's kind of hard to stomach in a way coming from a billionaire that apparently hasn't paid taxes and all this other innuendo. Um, but, you know, he's onto something. And in many respects, it's, it's refreshing. Um, but is, is, it, is it real? Um, or is it a smokescreen for simultaneously um, maybe engaging in this more nationalistic um, economic policy, which could be just, you know, potentially very dangerous. 
Um, but also bait and switch in terms of the effect that this will really have um, on these people that are expecting something um, in particular. Um, because everything that we're hearing coming out of the narrative of the, the, the appointments, uh, the political appointments to cabinet suggests that we're talking about massive deregulations, um, some of the traditional um, uh, Republican, um, libertarian sorts of uh, narratives. And it's really confusing to sort out what the, the effects of this will be. I think it's very confusing too. We were talking about the America First slogan or camp, yeah. whatever he has with that. Um, and that kind of is juxtaposed against normal Republican ideals of the free market. Because if you're limiting companies to like only produce their cars here or get heavily taxed, it's kind of against... Well, and furthermore, he's blaming, he was blaming um, the political elite of both parties that were sitting on the dais with him, um, which was really like, oh my gosh. Um, but you know, at the same time, good for him for calling it out. I, I just wonder if it's displaced blame, because really, when you think about it, it's corporate America that has become these international conglomerates that have put so much pressure on our system demanding so much in terms of military defenses for these trade routes um, and investment in infrastructure here or not, depending on the industry, the, the research and development and so forth, um, but, but they're not committed. And he's, he's right about that narrative, but he's not pointing fingers very clearly. He's blaming the political elite for not governing and directing these industries. Um, suggesting that they've been remiss not to hold them accountable. And, and there's a lot of truth to that, but w I think it fails to um, uh, properly assess the power that these international conglomerates like ExxonMobil have, which are now part of his administration, I mean, to affect the decisions of government and these very policies that have you know, caught up with the average American worker. Yeah, I think that's funny too, you mentioned, because Rex Tillerson, obviously CEO of ExxonMobil, Secretary of State pick, um, when he's saying that he wants to kind of go away from that influence on politics, he has it in his own cabinet. Yeah, it, you know, Trump alluded to the fact that if we just sort of start reinvesting in America again and build it up, um, I think we can all recognize that that's long overdue. We've been arguing about this in our politics. And interestingly, it's been the Democrats who have been arguing for this, but the Republican Party saying, well, where's the money? Where are we gonna get it from? And of course, no one wants to pay taxes. Um, and, and we're already trillions of dollars in debt. The next crisis comes along, it diverts our attention. We can't do this. And so we've been playing this constant catch up game, um, but it's also a delusional game. Um, uh, and you know, unfortunately, the average American worker is losing out on the equation. But it's not as simple as our government not um, drawing certain lines in the sand. The pressures of this internationalization of globalized economic, um, of these international conglomerates is so powerful. And they don't regard national boundaries in so many respects. They can't by virtue of the nature of what they're doing. Um, it begs the question, is the nation still, is the nation state that Trump wants to defend still really that viable? Not saying we won't achieve some sort of reinforcement of that notion for four years, eight years, whatever, but in the long run, um, have multinational corporations surpassed the ability of nation states to properly and effectively manage their, their power and influence? It's definitely an interesting question. We're gonna continue this conversation right after the break.